muted. Good morning. I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the Center for Health Journalism here at the USC Amberg School for Communication and Journalism. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar series. Th today we're going to be talking about whether pay for performance works. And this webinar is offered thanks to a generous grant from the National Institute of Healthcare Management Foundation. We'll take for a point of departure fundamental questions raised by two of our panelists. Dr. Robert Berenson, a fellow at the Urban Institute and a former commissioner of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, as well as Dr. Ashish Jha, a physician, health policy researcher, and advocate for global health care reform. Jha serves as the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. We'll also hear from journalist Sabria Rice, a veteran health care reporter, formerly with Modern Healthcare and CNN, and now a reporter at the Dallas Morning News. Pay for performance has emerged as one of the tenets of federal health care policy today built around the idea that systems should reward the quality or value of care rather than the volume of individual health care procedures. Medicare is unrolling value reimbursements quickly, calling for half of all payments to be tied to value by 2018. But does it work? Our experts will analyze the existing evidence while journalist Sabria Rice will offer ins insights on how to report and tell stories about these complex topics in a way that uh, educates and engages ordinary consumers. Before we get going, I'm just going to touch on a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first, we're going to hear from our three panelists, and then we'll take your questions. We have more than 200 people signed up for this webinar, so we'll ask you to raise a virtual hand on your webinar dashboard and share your questions through the chat or question box, and then we'll take them uh, during our Q&A period. Should you want to tweet about this webinar, the hashtag is P4PChat. We'll also be recording and archiving our conversation. We're going to start out with Dr. Ashish Jha. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, so this is a sheesh shot. Let me just get my screen going here. Okay. Can you guys all see the slides? I'm going to assume the answer is yes, and I'll just start speaking. Um, and uh, just make sure that. Great. So uh, my talk is entitled Aligning Incentives for Better Outcomes, State of Play. And what I'm going to try to do is kind of give an overview of why it is that we do pay for performance, um, what we know about the way it works, and give some of my thoughts on how to make pay for performance work better. Um, on the call and on this webinar, you have Bob Berenson, who I, I think is one of the smartest people in this area and has been thinking about this. And I'm, I'll be curious to know to what extent Bob and I uh, disagree or agree, but we'll get to that later. But let me get started. So why do we need pay for performance? Um, why are we even here? So if you look across almost any metric of healthcare, and I'm going to just show one piece of data, which is variations in heart attack mortality across U.S. hospitals. This is just from national Medicare data. And what you see is that there are hospitals where mortality rates risk adjusted are 5, 10, 15 percent. And there are hospitals where death rates uh, after heart attack are 30, 35, 40 percent. Medicare pays the same amount whether you're a 35% mortality hospital or a 15% mortality hospital. And there has been a sense for a very long time uh, that that's not right and it's not creating the kind of incentives we need uh, to make the healthcare system better. Because I think we'd all agree we'd rather be in the 10, 15% mortality hospital uh, and ideally we'd want a system that rewards an institution that has to make the investments to get to be a high quality hospital. So if you think about why is pay for performance attractive, um, first and foremost, it has tremendous face validity, right? We see this in all parts of our lives, in all sorts of industries. The idea that incentives for better quality uh, is really just, it, it makes a ton of sense. And the notion is, if you align incentives for better care, you allow providers to do well while doing good. Um, and so if that's the notion, we've been trying this in some ways for about 10 to 15 years in healthcare. And what I thought I would do is spend about five, ten minutes talking about what have we tried and how well has it worked. And I'm going to pick one specific example of a pretty substantial pay for performance program called the Premier Pay for Performance uh, Initiative, also known as the Hospital Quality Incentive Demonstration. Uh, it began in 2003. Uh, it put about 2% of Medicare payments at risk. 
um, mostly got hospitals to focus on process measures. What I mean by that is it got hospitals to try to do more evidence-based treatments. And it ran for six years. And the reason I've picked uh, Premier Pay for Performance or Premier Hospital Quality Incentive Demonstration is that it's the national model. It's the model that we have now used to create national pay for performance. And so it's worth understanding what happened with that program. And so if you look at the data from the premier demonstration, um, and it is a little bit of a complicated slide, but I, hopefully it, it, you can sort out what happened. Uh, the blue line is the premier hospitals that uh, lived under pay for performance. Yellow line is the non-premier hospitals. These are control hospitals. And what you can essentially see is for after six years of being under pay for performance, there was absolutely no impact whatsoever on mortality rates. So those numbers on the, on the y-axis are mortality rates. And uh, essentially what you had, I mean, if you ever want to see two lines that track more closely together, it's going to be hard to find. This is, I think, very convincing evidence that six years of premier pay for performance had really no impact whatsoever uh, on mortality. And if you then, that's the kind of formal study. If you looked at the press coverage that happened both with the premier paper and all of the data that has come out on paper performance, headlines around paper performance look something like this. Uh, you know, there's a health affairs article, health affairs article that found that paper performance did not support quality improvement. Uh, one of my favorite lines from Politico, new Nijum report, paper performance a bust. Paying doctors for quality doesn't work. Medicare's policy did not reduce infection rates. All, this is just for four different studies on pay for performance and what the headlines have been. And the point of bringing this slide up is that this is a field where this is not just about the premier demonstration that I showed you the data for, really across a wide range of different pay for performance programs, the answer or the, the impact has been really disappointing. Uh, captured perfectly by headlines like, this is a bust, it doesn't work, it, it doesn't spur quality improvement. So given that and despite that, the Affordable Care Act has actually put a lot of effort and time and uh, energy into using pay for performance. And the architects of the ACA would say that, you know, that those were the old days and, and we've learned a thing or two and we're, we can do it better. And so I want to highlight just a couple of the ACA provisions around pay for performance. I'll show you the data on what uh, has happened, and then I will wrap up. So there's a variety of new programs on paper performance within the Affordable Care Act. One of them is this thing called value-based purchasing, and I'll show you some data around that. Uh, another is hospital readmission reduction program. And again, I'll go through the details of each of these in a, in a minute. And now there's these things called penalties for hospital-acquired conditions. And very new, not part of the ACA, but very new, uh, in the last year is that we've had a new uh, bill passed uh, called MACRA, and within it is this thing called MIPS. As you guys know, the federal government uh, loves nothing more than acronyms, and so MIPS is really about uh, uh, incentives for providers. Uh, for, so it's a pay-for-performance scheme and trying to get doctors and, and uh, uh, ambulatory providers into sort of more value-based payments. And, and that just has passed and it's still being rolled out, and so we don't have any data on that. And so what I'm going to show you in terms of data is what we know from the value-based purchasing program and the hospital readmission reduction program. And the fundamental question is, if the old stuff didn't work, is this going to work any better? And as I suggested, we have some evidence. So let's go through it, and I'm going to actually start with the hospital readmission reduction program because that, that's sort of the better news of the two. Um, the way that this program was structured, just so you have the background, is that Medicare penalizes hospitals up to 3% of their Medicare payments for high readmission rates. That's, the, that's basically the deal. It started in 2011, and Medicare says if you have a higher than uh, expected readmission rate for a select group of conditions, um, let me just go back, sorry, select group of conditions, heart attack, heart failure, pneumonia, uh, and more recently, COPD and hip, uh, hip replacement, but initially for those three, uh, you get a penalty. And what we have seen is about 80 to 90 percent of hospitals across the country have gotten some form of penalty. So everybody tends to be a, a poor performer, at least on one of those measures. But we finally have evidence about whether it's making a difference in terms of actual readmission rates. And here's a paper from the New England Journal from this year uh, by uh, Zuckerman and colleagues 
And basically what they find is that uh, targeted conditions are the ones for which there are penalties, non-targeted conditions are the ones for which there are not. And they look at the onset of the Affordable Care Act as in 2010, and what they find is that readmission rates fell. And what's interesting about this is that uh, you can see that there was about a decline over 2010, 2011, 2012, and then it flattens back out. And so there's been about a 4% reduction uh, overall in the targeted conditions and a little bit of a reduction in non-targeted conditions in terms of readmissions. And so a lot of policymakers have seen this as good news that we've started moving the needle a bit on readmissions. And this is just a quick summary of which hospitals have gotten bulk of the penalties, and I'll kind of move this quickly uh, in the interest of time. But basically what you see is that if you have more black patients, more Hispanic patients, more divorced or never married patients, uh, more poorly educated patients, more poor patients, more patients in Medicaid, you're much more likely uh, to get penalized. And this is pretty consistent with a lot of data that says that most of the uh, high readmission rates are happening in safety net and other, um, uh, other hospitals that care for the poor. So let me talk a little bit more directly about VVP, which is the second kind of big national program. Uh, we think of this as a kind of a classic pay for performance program. 2% uh, of Medicare payments tied to a broad set of quality measures, some process measures, some outcomes measures, some patient experience measures, some efficiency measures. And here's from a paper that we just published about a month ago in the BMJ that looked at what happened to uh, mortality rates uh, with the onset of, of VBP, and we have some control hospitals, hospitals that were not part of the program. And so the control hospitals are in green, uh, the VBP hospitals are in red, and what you can see is that mortality rates kind of bounce around, but they've actually been coming down on their own uh, because we've been getting better at taking care of patients. Then the program kicks in, and what you see is essentially what I would argue is nothing. In the three years or so that VBP has been up and running, there has been no impact on mortality whatsoever. And then this is data looking at the impact of VBP on patient experience. This is proportion of hospitals, kind of patients giving hospitals a, a good score on patient experience scores. And what you can see is it had been going up about 1.5% per year. Uh, VBP kicked in, and basically it did nothing. What you're looking for is an inflection point up that somehow incentives are going to drive all these improvements, and we really don't see that at all. So I think if you take a step back and ask what have we learned from all of this, uh, I would argue that the readmissions is really the, one of the very few good news stories and suggests that incentives can move the needle potentially. Uh, if you have simple measures, readmission is a very simple and easy thing to count. Very narrowly focused, one of the advantages of the readmission program is that it's focused on one measure and one measure only, not a whole broad swath of things. They can also have unintended consequences, as we found out by the fact that um, we have primarily been penalizing safety net hospitals, and we need to understand trade-offs between lowering readmission rates for everybody, but delivering a lot of penalties to safety net hospitals. And reducing readmissions is not the same thing as actually making care better. We don't actually understand what has happened that has allowed the readmissions to drop. Is it that we're doing a better job of care coordination, or are we just denying people admission to the hospital if they come back to the emergency department within the first 30 days? We don't know. Um, and so I would say the jury remains out. So let's kind of reframe, and in the last two minutes, I'm going to just finish up by saying the old question that has been out there is does pay for performance work? I think, and this is a place where maybe uh, Dr. Berenson is going to disagree with me, but I think the new question is how do we get pay for performance to work? Because fundamentally not using any kind of incentives probably isn't a great idea either. And my thoughts have been, and I've said this before, but I, I kind of articulate that for me the bigger question, the questions are should we have much bigger incentives on the table? Maybe one, two, three percent aren't the right numbers. Maybe we should target a small number of outcomes as opposed to programs that have 10, 15, or 20 measures. Um, and, and should we be structuring it much more simply? Uh, a lot of these programs are very complicated. When I call hospital executives and ask them what they, how they're doing on them, they usually have no idea because of the complexity of the structure. And then the last but not least is the idea of playing into intrinsic motivation. The idea here, of course, is that doctors and nurses already want to do the right thing. And so you want to make sure that you have incentives that align with that and not contradict that. And measures that doctors and nurses don't buy into are going to create a lot of dissonance and actually make it much harder to move. And then I think we need a more nuanced approach to the safety net because a lot of these programs basically end up penalizing safety net hospitals. And I don't think anybody wants that to be a primary effect. And so we should really think about why that is and how do we avoid that. Thank you very much. 
Thanks so much, Dr. Job, for this excellent overview. Now we're going to turn to Dr. Garrison, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the criticism. Dr. Berenson, we're running into a little technical problem right now. We're going to skip over to uh, Sabria Wright, and then we're going to come back to you. Hello. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me. So um, this is Sabria Wright, I'm currently with the Dallas Morning News. Um, thanks to the Center for Health Journalism uh, to inviting me to participate in the panel and to all the participants. Thanks, so, um, what was that? I said thank you. We can hear you perfectly. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess I, I feel like I, I'm Previously with um, with CNN where I looked at um, consumer um, consumer health um, and then with modern healthcare where I looked at pay for, paying for performance from the perspective of the provider and now I'm with the Dallas Morning News where um, returning to um, uh, how all of this policy all of the changes that are happening in healthcare how the business um, impacts. Uh, the patient, how it impacts the consumers, which is everyone who experiences uh, the healthcare system, as we all do um, at some point. So um, I, I feel like what I can um, talk about to add, um, to follow up with Dr. Jha, is some of the, the, the challenges in covering emerging payment models um, as journalists and, and personalizing those stories and making them understandable to the average population who does not um, see these differences on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finding inter interesting perspectives to add context um, to some of the, which can be very complicated uh, policy talk, um, to generate potential story angles that, um, that really mean something and matter to the public. Um, so I think, Possibly to recap um, what Dr. Chow was saying, this is my understanding of pay performance <laughs> at the, uh, pay for performance at the moment, which is basically um, lots of things have been tried and and you um, it, it can be confusing. You start with a one idea, erase and and then kind of start again, looking at the pros and cons and kind of a, a domino effect how one uh, change uh, could lead to um, to um, to impacting a, a different aspect of healthcare. So, uh, for example, Dr. Da had mentioned um, readmissions, and it's something you know uh, that um, that the federal health, um, health officials have been tracking for um, at least um, uh, three years. Um, so, but then that could lead to other things, and as Dr. John mentioned, uh, changing the focus from um, what he mentioned, intrinsic motivations, and, and then therefore uh, changing where people pay um, the most attention. Um, so I wanted to delve a little bit into who all of this impacts um, right now. Um, the one thing I left off here is the patient. but. The, um, the, the providers that are involved that are impacted by pay for pay for performance is not just hospitals and health systems. It can range from anyone from physicians to drug makers, to C-suite, dialysis providers. All of these different uh, groups are attempting um, to uh, introduce new um, payment structures to uh, drive down costs, improve ca patient care, and um, and uh, hopefully improve outcomes. Um, but the challenge that many are facing is um, the idea that if money is dangled in front of you, uh, that you are going to follow the money. Um, so uh, as was me mentioned previously, the intrinsic motivations 
um, which can lead to care that is a transaction governed by price. Um, not to mention the administrative costs um, to uh, capture all of this data and, and documentation um, to track it. So, um, move forward. So, for finding perspective to talk about uh, to talk about this really um, complex problem, I say for journalists looking to um, to delve into it, one great place to start might be early adopters of um, of, of uh, emerging payment models. So. Um, for example, the um, people who participated in the 2003 demonstrations, uh, what they learned, um, what worked, what doesn't work, and um, uh, looking at some of the uh, possibilities going forward, um, because the um, um, the motivation, it just varies by industry, um, which is all of the different groups listed on the previous slide what motivates them and what works in a certain market might be very different. So looking at the early adopters and what they've learned um, could be helpful. I think um, talking to behavioral econ economists and psychologists also adds a very interesting perspective. Uh, they um, particularly can talk about uh, what what motivates people and what gets them to um, provide the kind of quality care that we are searching for within the healthcare system. So their perspective um, is very interesting in that it looks um, beyond the, the policy at, you know, the, the idea and the concepts that motivate each of us, um, no matter what we're doing um, in our day-to-day -day work. Um, um, as Dr. Jha mentioned, safety net hospitals, which have a very big incentive to do well, are often the, the ones who are most impacted by losing mon money um, um, under, uh, under penalties. So I think there are stories to be told about what they are doing and what works and, and what doesn't work within those communities um, as they try to grapple with a lot of the changes that are health, happening in the healthcare system right now. And then other industries. Um, often, one thing that was fascinating to me um, when I started uh, writing about uh, paper performance and the uh, effort to improve quality was how much has been learned um, from other industries, especially aviation and engineering. But um, there are, you know, I mentioned previously behavioral economists, but then education might um, offer an interesting parallel um, in terms of rewarding or penalizing um, uh, teachers uh, for how well their students do. I feel like there might be interesting parallels there um, that journalists could dig into and lessons learned from those efforts and how they overlap with healthcare. So, um, in terms of potential stories, uh, I think there are ways to localize um, paper performance and look at the, the different outcomes. One of uh, Dr. Zhao's first slides, for example, looked at variations in mortality um, for heart attacks. I feel like getting to the differences locally, um, you might find great um, stories that look at why one provider in a very similar area might do well while another um, in that same community doesn't do well. So looking at, um, not to point the finger or blame anyone, but looking at what, what differences they face. Um, it could be the communities that they serve, um, business models, that sort of thing, and why um, they might be more likely to be dinged or rewarded under um, incentive programs. Um, another thing that um, I feel is missing from the conversation is the actual financial impact of the uh, federal health care uh, or federal penalties. Um, you know, there, they, uh, there are many of them, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, but all of the, from the various different um, programs to track quality and uh, move away from fee-for-service, the, the penalties, they add up. So looking at how um, 
hospitals in your area are changing the way they do business in order to um, adjust and what that means for patients. Um, will they be aligning services differently? Are they consolidating to, to um, get ahead of this? Um, I feel like there are interesting things there. And then um, finally, where is necessity uh, driving in invention? Um, especially among hospitals with very minimal resources who are trying to avoid getting uh, uh, penalized, what are they doing um, to uh, get ahead and to not have this impact the care that they provide to the patients? So um, that's really all I had from a journalist perspective. Um, it's a very complicated issue to, uh, to talk about and write about. But I, I definitely feel there are ways to get beyond um, the, uh, I guess, the political speak and look at the impact on a local level. Thank you so much, Sabria. Um, yeah. We're still trying to sort out some of the technical issues for Dr. Behrens, and so I thought we would take a question from one of the uh, people in the audience and just want to mention um, that if you all have a question, you can use your chat or question field to send us questions, and we can ask some of our speakers. So this is a question from Al Colvin. He actually sent it through Twitter, um, and he said, uh, how does the non-compliant patient factor into the equation? Uh, Dr. Jaw, do you have any thoughts on that? Dr. Jaw, you might be muted. Okay, you're now unmuted, Dr. Jaw, so go ahead. Uh, you can now answer the question. Apologies for that. Hey, um, so I'm going to assume you guys can hear me, or and you'll tell me if not. Um, so I, I saw that question on Twitter. Uh, it's actually a good question. Um, and almost all the programs are structured in a way that having uh, non, quote, unquote, non-compliant patients generally don't hurt you. And let me give some examples. A lot of the process measures are about what the doctor does. Did you prescribe an antibiotic in time? Did you uh, prescribe the right medications? Um, a lot of the outcomes are like mortality for a heart attack. Yes, it can be, it's a short-term mortality, 30 days. Um, most of the time, most of what happens is driven by how the hospital behaves. Uh, so uh, non-compliant patients can make a difference, but I don't think that's usually the biggest issue on a lot of these things like mortality and, and process measures and experience. Where it makes a bigger difference is on readmissions, and this is part of the reason why safety in hospitals, I think, tend to do worse, is you can imagine that part of what you need to do to avoid readmission is to follow up with your primary care physician. Well, if your primary care physician uh, is not somebody whose office you can get to easily, uh, you don't have the resources to get there, you can't take a taxi, et cetera, you're going to have a harder time. Or maybe you just uh, have other issues and you're not going to go. Those potentially end up hurting you. So I think on some measures it matters, but most of the times it doesn't. Thank you very much. So um, I, I guess, uh, oh, here we have a question from Kelly Hardy. She says, do you know of any P4, P4P studies on child vaccinations? Ooh, that's a good question. I, uh, I do not. Um, you know, I mean, pay for performance that targets providers. I mean, most doctors uh, are, I think, very focused on trying to get childhood vaccination rates very high. I think my sense of, not my area of expertise, but my sense of where childhood vaccinations tend to fall down to the extent that uh, they do is much more driven by uh, communities where patients, pa uh, parents, uh, somehow have uh, gotten into their heads that it's uh, not good for their kids to get the vaccination. But I, I, I don't know of any P4P -P programs around this. And Sabria, you've just gone from a very specialized um, publication, Modern Healthcare, that has as its audience, um, you know, uh, people in the business to uh, working for the Dallas Morning News where you're trying to reach a general consumer, how, how do you make these really complex topics uh, accessible to the general reader and, and why should they care about this? Well, I think they should care because the changes that are happening within the healthcare system now impact all of us. It's not, um, it's, it seems like it's a very foreign concept and you know, that, that, shouldn't, that doesn't matter to me as long as I, I get what I need. But in the, in the bottom line is it impacts all of us in terms of uh, how much we pay and the quality of care that we receive. 
So I think that is the key to simplifying it, putting it in that perspective for um, patients. Um, it, you know, they won't delve so much into the minutia, but understanding the the changes that are happening and how it, um, how they, on very simple things, what it means when you go to the doctor, or what it means when you are um, undergoing care for a certain procedure, and arming them with the the questions and the information so that um, they too can be um, con good consumers of healthcare and um, reduce some of the unintended consequences of a change. Um, thank you very much. So, Dr. Barrington, I think we finally have you here. Unfortunately, um, I, yeah. So, uh, I now have control of your screen uh, because uh, we, while we have your voice here, I haven't figured out the screen. So, if you just tell me uh, next, I'll switch your slides. So, uh, so now you're on your your slide. If you measure it, you can't manage it. Am I ready to go at this point? You're ready to go. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that uh, disruption. All right. So let me apologize to everybody out there. We were having what's called technical difficulties. Um, I'm now ready to go with my presentation. Sorry, we're going out of order, but I think we'll be able to pick up. So right now you are hearing me no problem. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, okay. and I think you should now have control of your own screen, uh, also, Dr. Yep, Barron. I do. So let me. I'm sorry, I, I missed uh, the second presentation by Sabia. I heard um, Ashish's presentation, and I'll pick up where he left off. I think to some extent, I think Ashish sort of helped me make my case, uh, which is that pay for performance is an idea whose time has passed, although. In my presentation, I will acknowledge there may be some limited role for it. So let me get going. Um, first, uh, addressing the face validity issue that Ashish referred to, it's almost impossible to go to a seminar in healthcare today without seeing this quote presented like right up first on the first slide. So I'm presenting it on the first slide. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And in fact, its cousin, if something cannot be measured, it cannot be improved, has been called a truism. A truism being something that is so obvious it doesn't even need to be said. Well, it wasn't obvious to me. About eight months ago, I had a few extra moments and I decided to um, uh, look up the derivation of this. It's commonly attributed to W. Edwards Deming, who's a revered management expert who helped turn around the Japanese economy after World War II. He's considered the father of total quality management in U.S. industry. And so the idea here is if, if Dr. Emmett Deming said this, it must be right. Well, I went and got his, I googled and then found his book. What he actually wrote was, it is wrong to suppose that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, a costly myth. He, this was a quote not, not taken out of context. It was an overt misquote because if you look at his whole body of writing, he actually thought we were overdoing the role of, of measurement and, uh, and data. And, uh, you know, the second quote there, management by numerical goal was an attempt to manage without knowledge of what to do and in fact is usually management by fear. Well, maybe Deming was wrong, but maybe the quote itself has, has merit. So I looked for other sources and I found Peter Drucker's website, Peter Drucker being another uh, very well-respected, now deceased management scholar, and his website, which is still maintained, basically said, now people think Drucker may have said this, but he wouldn't have said it because he thought the most important thing to manage is relationships which are hard to measure. And so there are, there's a small body of people who react to this uh, uh, aphorism, you can't measure it, you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it by quoting Albert Einstein. Not everything that can be counted counts, not everything that counts can be counted. And it turns out that it wasn't Albert Einstein. Although if you, if you Google this quote, you will find that uh, a couple of dozen images of 
of Professor Einstein supposedly writing this quote on his blackboard. It was, in fact, it seems to have been uh, uh, developed or, or introduced by a sociologist named William Bruce Cameron, leading me to the conclusion no wonder we don't get evidence, we don't do evidence based policy making, we can't even get quotes right. Um, so basically, of course, we have to measure sometimes. Sometimes it's indispensable. I practice medicine for 20 years. I accept the fact that for controlling hypertension, high blood pressure, you have to measure the blood pressure in order to manage it. But uh, even here, we still don't have uniform high standards for measuring blood pressure, either clinically or purposes of public reporting and pay for performance. Uh, how you measure a blood pressure actually is very important. And um, while there's some clinical recommendations in the, in the academic literature, nobody follows them, in fact. So even things that have to be measured, we don't necessarily measure correctly. And there are many other things that we don't measure. I'll be coming back uh, to that theme. So here I want to make the point that accurate measurement is difficult. Even relying on a seemingly straightforward metric such as hospital readmission rates, which Ashish did this, described, can be misleading. I mean, what could be simpler than a readmission rate? It's uh, the, numerator, the numerator is the readmissions, the denominator is the admissions. It's a simple ratio of one over, over the other. But what we have learned, in addition, and I will acknowledge that the readmission rate has come down, uh, probably in response to the financial incentives in the ACA program that Ashish described. But when a healthcare system successfully reduces readmissions, they often reduce admissions. And the change in the ratio may not reflect this success. In other words, uh, it, can, it can be misleading uh, to just rely on this ratio in terms of uh, describing what success is. Uh, Ashish talked about a very real problem that hospitals serving very different patient populations in geographic areas with different resources when they are compared to each other. Uh, you're comparing in many cases, um, well, I won't say it's quite apples and oranges, but uh, where you uh, sort of the challenges that one hospital face that can be very different from another hospital uh, and yet we have a an approach in Medicare that treats them all equally. Uh, Ashish has described that issue. Uh, but there can be an opportunity also for hospitals to engage in, in what's sometimes called regulatory evasion by calling an admission an observation stay. So it's not an admission at all. Uh, this one is in dispute. The Wall Street Journal did a, a very detailed report suggesting that there was significant relabeling of readmissions as observation stays, so it would make, their, make the data look better. CMS then issued a report saying that was not the case, but it certainly is potentially the case that that is what could be going on, and it certainly does go on with other measures. So uh, measurement is difficult. I also want to just make clear that I'm not opposed to measurement altogether. A measurement for public reporting and especially for pay for performance is a different uh, is a different animal from measurement for internal quality improvement. For internal quality management, having data to assess an intervention is desirable, although I think even there as as Deming would say, it's sometimes overrated. I'm focusing on public reporting and pay for performance. So let's stipulate, and here I will agree with some of what Ashish laid out, that what's sometimes called the status quo ante, the, the situation before we got into all of this uh, measurement and pay for performance, uh, that was, there was no accountability. Uh, we were producing mediocre quality and too much spending. So it's not like opposing pay for performance means one has to support the status quo ante of no accountability. You know come back to that. Uh, public reporting has value, uh, I think more probably than pay for performance. And in fact, in some ways it's similar to pay for performance in the, in the sense that uh, uh, public reporting is supposed to affect uh, a hospital or a health system's reputation and reputation can move market share. So it ultimately does have a, a financial incentive and probably has had some positive value, especially for 
bad performers who are embarrassed by, by their bad performance. They can't have that positive value. And I would also acknowledge that at this point we can't put the genie of performance measurement back in the bottle, even though some of us would like to. Uh, we now are doing performance measurements, so we probably should do it better rather than, than the way we're doing it now. And in some circumstances, pay for performance can be useful as part of a comprehensive payment approach, uh, which uh, I'll get to also in a moment. But there are significant concerns, and the first one I want to say is I don't think this has uh, what the New England Journal uh, once called compelling logic or face validity. Uh, the behavioral economists, and I missed the, uh, the second presentation, uh, describe uh, crowding out. Uh, that is, if you take health professionals who, who, who multitask and have complex professional activities, uh, if you start um, paying them for particular activities with financial rewards or penalties, you may crowd out uh, their general professional obligation and duty to, to practice high quality across the board. Uh, we don't have a lot of data on that, but it's certainly a conceptually uh, of concern. Uh, and that leads to sort of the more concrete testing to the test. If you, if you measure particular things, uh, you may get a decrement in the performance on the things you're not measuring because everybody's so concentrating on those particular things so that these two together could result in an overall performance decline uh, even if the incentivized performance improves. Um, in other words, we measure much less than what we care about and as I next go to, I'm, I'm going to suggest we don't measure very many important things. There's these operational challenges beyond the conceptual. There's major gaps in available measures. Uh, measures rely largely on claims data with no other reliable and cost reasonable sources on the horizon, except probably uh, patient surveys about patient experience. Uh, we have small numbers, and that's a real problem when we're trying to measure individual clinician performance, and that's the heart of the macro legislation that we're going to, with the MIPS, the Merit Incentive Payment System, going to be measuring individual doctor performance, uh, or they can be grouped, but ultimately uh, the, the theory is we'll be measuring individual performance. The small numbers don't per permit statistical significance in many cases. We have high administrative costs associated with all this collection of data. A recent health affairs paper estimated that we spend $15.4 billion a year just in the cost to physician practices uh, for physician uh, pay for performance. Uh, that's $15 billion that could actually be improving some people's health care rather than this uh, process that we've got going on now. And there's provider gaming behavior in response to pay for performance to the detriment of patient care. So it's been described in Pennsylvania and New York State, which have for many years been reporting uh, coronary artery bypass mortality rates that doctors will avoid the more difficult patients that declines as risk adjustment becomes better. There was a recent paper about the rise in 31-day mortality rates. Why? Because we measure 30-day mortality rates. So one can imagine what's going on with the patients who died on day 31. So here's one that doesn't get much attention, which has occupied my, my attention recently. And that is that the current policy infatuation, and I call it an infatuation with measurement, reporting, and, and P for P, leads to this perverse policy result. What we measure is considered important and demands attention. What we can't or don't measure is marginalized or ignored altogether, such as diagnosis errors, which is a major quality problem in, in U.S. healthcare. The Institute of Medicine committee I was on, Ashish was on, uh, found research finding anywhere from 5 to 15 percent of encounters with the healthcare system result in a misdiagnosis or a missed diagnosis. Uh, and yet we can't measure them outside of research projects, and so I would argue we don't pay it any attention. They get no respect as the title of a recent health affairs article. So I would say, yes, we have to use measures because the genie is out of the bottle, and here I agree with some of what the, uh, uh, Ashish said. 
we should use measures more strategically as part of major quality improvement initiatives, such as with the hospital re, uh, readmission uh, policy. Move measurement to the level of the organization, not the individual clinician. It would be nice to know what your local doc is doing. I don't think we can do it on a national basis. Try to move from process to outcome measurement. Place greater emphasis on patient experience and patient reported outcome measures. Uh, that, I think, has more promise than, than using claims to try to capture clinical information. And finally, invest more in the basic science of measurement development, tasking a single entity with defining standards for measuring and reporting performance to improve the validity and comparability of data and to anticipate and prevent the unintended adverse consequences. Uh, to a large extent, we're proceeding with performance measurement and pay for performance without establishing the validity of, of what we're doing. So my alternatives to pay for performance, because I don't think we should go back to business as usual, would be uh, to reduce the incentives in basic payment that produce too much care, hastily and carelessly provided, instead of trying to counter these dominant incentives with relatively small pay for performance dollars. We have huge distortions, for example, in the physician fee schedule that pays too much for tests and procedures and not enough for time spent, and we're not going to overcome those powerful incentives by a little bit of pay for performance. And then finally, I want to cite uh, Lucian Leap, who was commenting on the success of the Michigan Keystone Project, which successfully eliminated central line associated bloodstream infections in Michigan hospitals. The most powerful methods for reducing medical harm are feedback, learning from the best, and working in collaboration. Nowhere did he say you have to measure and reward or penalize. He actually promoted and the whole project promoted a whole collaborative effort. Uh, as part of a collaborative effort, yes, there might be a role for measurement. That's very different from what we've got going currently in the Medicare program. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Berenson, and, and, and thanks um, everyone for your patience with these uh, technical glitches. Dr. Berenson, I wanted to turn to our questions, and we have one that seems perfectly geared to you from somebody named Craig Lisk. He asks, so what quality measures do you think are most important to measure for rewarding or penalizing providers, and what measures do you think are most important for consumers? Uh, the consumers, I think we, we actually have a good start because uh, there have been many years' worth of development of the CAP surveys, uh, the consumer assessment of it initially stood for health plan um, uh, satisfaction, but it's now been extended to medical groups and others. Um, I think um, so measuring sort of the patient experience of care uh, with their doctors, if I had a a concern about that current approach is that I think it 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 asks more too much about routine care, uh, how long you have to wait in the waiting room, uh, were the was the staff attentive to my problems, and not enough about patients who actually are in crisis, have, have acute events happening, need to have an advocate for them. So I would oversample and 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 uh, and try to get information. Uh, from affected patients about how their providers performed uh, in under duress in, in essence, but uh, I think we can do that through surveys. Uh, for providers, I guess what I there's a lot of interest right now in in moving from thousands of measures which are potentially available and have been developed to what's called core measures. My own view is that we should focus on measures around particular quality improvement initiatives and that we should rotate just a couple of measures every few years to try to uh, try to achieve change. So having measures associated with readmissions I think can be a quality improvement activity and, and was actually selected by CMS as part of the Partnership for Patients initiative. Um, my own favorite is actually standardizing how we measure blood pressure and getting everybody's blood pressure under control uh, have that be a specific quality improvement uh, effort and and use measurement for that purpose. I guess my basic point is that we shouldn't be measuring for the purposes of measuring, uh, but we should measure 
largely for quality improvement. Let organizations like accountable care organizations measure. Uh, uh, they are in a much better position to improve care in their local communities than, than Medicare uh, on a national basis can use uh, measurement, so, so uh, sort of on a, on a broad based basis. I, I specifically think that the macro approach of putting a value uh, on every doctor, which is where the MIPS takes us by 2019, every doctor is going to have a, a value placed on, their, uh, on them based on some mediocre measures of quality and, and, and an inability to actually measure their costs, but nevertheless CMS has to try. I don't think that's what we should be, I don't think the government should be placing a value on every doctor. Um, our next question is from Bill Herdock and uh, Ashish or uh, Sabri, I don't know if you want to give a try at this. Um, he asks, those with multiple chronic conditions are at higher risk of poor outcomes, yet uh, those PPP models focus only on single conditions. How can we avoid these problems and unintended consequences? Uh, so this is Ashish. Let me, um, I'm going to, if it's okay, it takes 30 seconds to say a couple of things about Bob Berenson's talk. So uh, my, biggest, um, uh, my biggest frustration with his talk is that I actually agree with him on almost everything he said, and, I, and somehow I have created an impression that I don't. Let me make a couple of keep, I'm, I'm kidding, but you get the point. I think we're actually on the same page about where things are. Maybe where there is a disagreement is about whether it's, ready, it's really time to move on or whether it's time to do a substantial overhaul and try it a little bit differently, um, or try it very differently. The, you know, the, the bottom line is I think there is broad agreement now that the measurement uh, scheme has gone, uh, has gone awry. It is, we're way over measuring stuff that has absolutely little to no value. We're not measuring things that matter enormously to patients. Um, and these little incentive programs are somewhere between ineffective and insulting. Uh, but don't really do the things that Bob was talking about. So I, I think the consensus is actually uh, coming together that we're not doing it right. Where I think reasonable people can disagree is, so if we could identify the five, seven, ten things that really matter and really focus on that, uh, is there still a role for incentives? And I, I tend to come out on the side of there is. Um, but now let me get to the, to the question in front of us, which is about complexity of patients and multiple chronic conditions. So anytime you move towards outcomes, there's supposed to be an effort to try to do risk adjustment. And, you know, the, the, again, with most of these things, the debate comes down to, well, you know, academics say the risk adjustment is not very good, or the patient, or actually the provider organizations say the risk adjustment isn't very good, and then the measure developers say, oh, you always whine about risk adjustment. And the truth is that in some measures, we actually do a pretty good job of risk adjustment, and in other measures, we do a terrible job of risk adjustment. And so it's a very measure-specific answer. And so for some conditions, people who have multiple chronic diseases, we do a reasonably good job of accounting for that in our modeling. Uh, I think some mortality measures, for instance, it's pretty good uh, ability to handle that. Whereas for readmissions, the risk adjustment is really quite mediocre. And so if you have a lot of patients who have multiple chronic conditions, uh, you're going to have higher readmission rates because the risk adjustment is really inadequate. Um, so this is an ongoing source of, of debate, but I think, uh, as with many of these things, there's, it's complex. People are trying to work on it, but I would say we have a long way to go. And hi, this is Sabria. I would just add to that that um, kind of uh, hospitals and health systems are getting really creative with how they manage population-based uh, health. So um, looking at at how they um, reach out to patients and go out go beyond the walls of the hospital um, is one way in which they are doing that. Not just through measurement, but just through um, kind of changing their approach to patient care um, to get um, to patients uh, at higher risk for certain conditions before they be, they before it gets out of hand. Um, so there's a lot of effort um, on that front as well. Thank you. Um, we have a question now from Parth Modi who asks, what does the risk assessment used in the Medicare pro program, oh, I'm sorry, why does the risk assessment used in the Medicare program not adequately control for safety net hospitals? 
so this is actually something I can start that, and, and I, Bob is going to have additional uh, thoughts on this. But um, I'm not sure I know how to interpret the question because there are two ways of interpreting it. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the measures just don't. Uh, they basically don't take into account um, socioeconomic status, where you live, et cetera. Um, and, the, and it does take into account sort of risk things like, you know, what, what chronic diseases you have, et cetera. But those measures generally don't capture the severity of those illnesses very well. Um, it's, a, it's a total choice uh, why CMS has chosen not to do this. Uh, there is a, a group within CMS that has convinced themselves uh, that uh, two things at the same time. One is that it doesn't really matter. And I think there's very good empirical evidence that it does actually matter. And then the second is a line that they like to use a lot, which is that uh, somehow we don't want to hold safety at hospitals to a different standard. We don't want to say it's okay to provide bad care just because your patients are poor. Well, of course we don't, but that's not what adjustment does. We just, I think we shouldn't be penalizing hospitals because they provide care to more poor patients. That's what we don't want to do. And this is, a, I think, this confusion within uh, folks at CMS I mean, my, my underlying, uh, you know, now I'm going to read into motivations, is that there is any, anything that seems to come across as criticism of an ACA program, they are defensive and kind of immediately react to. But in my mind, there's very little kind of uh, logical reason to say on something like readmissions, uh, we're just going to assume that the super wealthy hospital in the, in the fancy part of town uh, should have the same readmission rate as a safety net hospital where 30% of their patients are homeless. That, that it just it, it flies in, in, in the face of logic, but I think it has been very hard to get across to folks at CMS. Can I jump in for just uh, 20 seconds on that? I agree with the Shisha's analysis completely. To me, the alternative, which CMS is not doing, is developing an improvement model, uh, except where a hospital's base uh, readmission rate is and and even provide financial incentives if you must to have them reduce that rate then we have risk adjusted their case mix we have basically said you're starting with your own population and we want to see substantial improvement uh, the criticism of that will be the better the better hospitals who uh, have less opportunity to improve uh, won't get their perhaps their share of, of the bonuses but we can figure out how to deal with that uh, to me, the, this reality of that hospitals are, are completely differently situated in terms of their patient population and their resources calls for a different approach rather than having hospitals competing with each other. Um, Sabria, did you want to add something or should we go on to our next question? Oh, no, I think they explained it perfectly. So this is a question from Erica Mobley who asks, what do you think about P4P programs that health plans are putting in place? How should providers manage being measured on different metrics by different payers? I would oh, say I guess what I would oh, go ahead, Sabrina. I would say that's part of the biggest challenge that the industry is facing right now, um, the multitude of measures that are coming from so many different aspects. And I think uh, both Dr. Berenson and, and Dr. Ja had mentioned kind of a standardization and um, organizing um, so that either a smaller amount of metrics are rolled out at a time so that you can track what's working and what's not. Um, but that, that I wouldn't say that that's one of the, the biggest challenges that the industry is facing. And if I could add, there was a, uh, a health affairs piece about two years ago that looked at four different uh, uh, well respect um, uh, uh, vendors or uh, intermediaries, I guess, information brokers is one term for them, which were evaluating the best hospitals and the worst hospitals uh, in the U.S. And n there was basically no overlap. Uh, they used different criteria, different methodologies. Uh, so this wasn't health plan measures, these were information brokers. Uh, and we had no consistency whatsoever. And so it goes to my point is that we've got a lot of noise here, and, but what are consumers supposed to make out of this if, if one of the objectives of performance measurement is to provide objective information for consumer choice? 
it's a model right now. And so when health plans each develop their own measure set, which, which they might want to, it just creates lots of problems for providers having to respond when the providers themselves may not respect the measures. And, and that's a major problem in Medicare because the docs don't respect the measures they're being evaluated against. This is a sheesh, uh, quick thing on that. So that paper Bob uh, refers to, I was a co-author on it. We, just as a little bit of, uh, we looked at hospitals that get, got graded by LeapFrog, US News, Health Grades, Consumer Reports, and basically found that there was, one program told you this hospital was terrific, and another program told you that hospital is terrible and you should avoid it at all costs. And, and the reason that underlies it is when you have a, you know, a plethora of measures at your disposal, each of these uh, measurement schemes end up uh, picking the ones that they personally like and, so, and coming up with their own weights. And so, for instance, Consumer Reports you know, says, well, mortality is bad, but readmissions is twice as bad as dying. And so hospitals that have high readmission rates end up looking terrible in Consumer Reports. Uh, whereas they may not in the U.S. News uh, and World Report program. So it, it's, there is a lot of craziness that's happening out there. I think there are a lot of good faith efforts, but people are just doing it all so differently, everybody using slightly different measures and weighting, that it, it baffles me, and I study this stuff for a living. I can't imagine that any of it is useful to consumers. Dr. Jaw, uh, Amanda Dunker asks if you could speak more about your research on how patient experience is affected or not affected by value-based purchasing. As she asks, what measure of patient experience did you use in your research and how would you suggest other people investigate this question? Yeah, so I, 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 I like, first of all, I just want to say I, I'm a fan of the patient experience measures. I actually think Bob made a couple of really interesting and important points about how we might improve them. Uh, but there has been some amount of pushback, especially among doctors, that somehow patient experience measures are just hospitality measures, and they, they, have, they can get into some of those uh, issues, but there's some very important issues about being treated with dignity and respect and having your, uh, having your issues addressed uh, that are very, very important part of paper performance. Most of our work on this has focused on the hospital side where there is the HCAP survey. Uh, HCAPS is a, is a survey that you, you can get for every hospital in the country. You can get patient experience scores uh, from the hospital compare website. And there are a bunch of individual measures like having your pain responded to or your uh, good communication. There are overall scores like, you know, would you recommend this to your family or, or friends? Um, on the value-based kind of pay for performance part of it, uh, as Bob would predict, uh, we're finding that the, the incentives are having no effect on, on any of this stuff. Uh, but it, I still think it's a very important measure. And for journalists, if you're trying to understand kind of who's a good hospital and who's not in your community and are overwhelmed by the 130 measures that are available on, on the hospital care website, actually I don't know if it's exactly that number, but some very large number, um, patient experience might be a good place to start. So um, we'll take a final question from Linda Rushing, who says that uh, she's an MD and she wants to understand better the difference between P for P for the hospitals and for MDs. She says, I come from a hospital environment. I'm sorry, she didn't say she was an MD. She said she came from a hospital environment. She's aware that the penalties that, uh, the penalties that hospitals face, but it appears that private practice MDs are also affected. Yet when we talk about readmission mortality rates, uh, we're talking about hospitalizations. So let me maybe start, and then Bob, I know, had some thoughts on this uh, in his slides. I want to make one point that Bob made that, that I think is critical, which is this idea of intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. As a physician, as a pri I, I still see patients, I feel very motivated to try to do a good job for my patients. And if somebody showed up and said, hey, we'll give you an extra 50 bucks if you work a little harder, as I said earlier, it would not only not motivate me, it probably would be insulting and I, I, I wouldn't listen to what they wanted me to do. Um, but so humans have intrinsic motivations. Hospitals don't really have intrinsic motivations. Like, like hospitals really are run by CFOs and CEOs who look at things like bottom line numbers. And uh, so I am much more amenable and open to the idea of big incentives institutions because the issues around underlying and motivations are different. Now hospitals obviously can turn around and give the same incentives to their individual doctors and then you get into the same problem. And I'm less of a fan of incentivizing uh, individual doctors because of the issues 
uh, that Bob raised. But uh, I'm happy to turn over the rest of this. I know we're running out of time to Bob and, and see what his and, and Sabria and see what their thoughts are on this broader issue. Yeah, let me. I'll do. I'll go next. Uh, the first point, which I don't think policymakers really quite understand or understood when they set up these programs, is that the economics of hospitals and doctors practices are very different. I actually think 1 to 2 percent, uh, the readmission penalty can be as much as 3 percent for hospitals, is not trivial for hospitals. Hospital margins typically are in the low single digits. A uh, quarter of the hospitals in the country have negative margins. You don't want to ignore 1 or 2 percent. 1 or 2 percent to a physician practice is, uh, is pretty trivial. A doctor can see another patient uh, a week and sort of, well, maybe every other day and make that up. So the economics are really different. Um, uh, so that's one thing. You've got uh, a better ability to measure at the hospital level because you've got a sufficient numbers to produce some statistical significance. And I agree with Ashish, uh, the implications of my remarks are that uh, individuals respond differently, probably respond differently to financial incentives than organizations do. That is, if you don't believe Mitt Romney's comment that corporations are people, uh, I think organization, he said corporations are people. I don't think that's right. I think they are organizations and can respond differently. Uh, but I do want to finish with just one point, the one area where I think Ashish and I do have a disagreement. Uh, he suggested maybe, uh, on a, at least on a test basis, increasing uh, the incentives uh, for pay for performance. We're actually doing that under MACRA. We're going to go to as much as a 9% penalty for doctors and even more than a 9% bonus if they do a very good job. That's getting to be real money. And I am reminded of a Catskills joke, uh, which is the food's terrible and the portions are too small. Uh, we've together all described the problems right now. Uh, my last uh, bullet and what I think needs to happen is we need to establish the science of performance measurement. We need to figure out what we're doing here, what measures we want to use, how to measure statistically significant, how to avoid side effects uh, before we decide to raise the portion size, uh, in my view. I do think it's a work in progress, and at this point, uh, let, us, let us agree that we need a refresh button rather than just a deletion but I don't think we're anywhere near being able to say let's uh, let's now throw 10% in into hospitals or or 10 or 15% into doctor pay for performance when we don't have good measures we don't know how to measure them accurately we get uh, perverse uh, side effects that affect patients negatively let's figure out how to make it work on a small small scale basis before we scale at large. This is Ashish. I have to go. That was brilliant, Bob. Um, I'll, I'm going to use your cat skills joke at some point. But thank you all. I'm sorry to jump off, but uh, this was great, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to go. Thank you so much, everybody. Sabria, did you want to uh, close with any final comment looking into your reporter's crystal ball and thinking about what you're going to be doing next for, on this topic for the morning news? Yeah, I would just say, you know, part uh, we, we've talked a lot about the challenges and, and part of you know, what's difficult, especially on a local uh, level, is, you know, um, as they've mentioned, every day a new rating comes out from a different um, organization, and we're, um, as Dr. John mentioned, one group might do great on leapfrog, they might do horrible on consumer reports. Just adding that perspective um, to any um, reporting that I'm doing, I think is, you know, is important, something I, I definitely learned at Modern Healthcare and uh, would We'll definitely continue um, looking at like uh, local institutions' um, performance, but then just being able to um, to focus more specifically on um, on the specific aspects of care that where where there are strong measures. I think that's important um, as journalists to be able to look at those and be able to highlight those and and help clear up the picture and, instead of adding to the noise. Well, um, 
I want to just thank all of our uh, panelists for this really interesting and uh, incisive commentary on a, a very important set of questions that are not uh, often really thought about or discussed by an ordinary consumer. And I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Berenson for managing to interject a cat skills joke into a policy <laughs> webinar. Um, mm -hmm. but I want to ask everybody here, um, we're going to send you a quick survey. Um, they're very helpful to us in telling us what you like, what you would like to see next from us, so I urge you to fill that out. And uh, also wanted to let everybody know that the uh, archived version of this webinar and all the slides and resources will be available on Center for Health Journalism.org. Thank you all so much.